Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors, America's only daily outdoor TV show. Your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax. It's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors. I'm Bill Allen sitting in for Winston Chester. It is uh, great to be here. Uh, I want to thank all the people who have uh, asked about when the show was going to be back on and, and how much you missed it and made those comments. It's really, really heartwarming. I know, I know Winston feels the same way. We've got, uh, we've got a great show lined up for you this morning. With, we will talk about fishing some, and we're also going to talk about some updates on what's going on in the city and the county. Well, let's get to the weather first, brought to us by Haney Technical Center. You got a high today of uh, 56 with a low tonight of around 38. A uh, little bit better day, a little more sunshine today. Uh, north wind 5 to 10 miles an hour. Uh, the uh, tide is low this morning at about 10.15 and then high tonight at 11.50. Uh, Peak fishing time is going to coincide right around uh, sunset, uh, which is going to be the 3.15 to 5.15 uh, time period, and it is listed as uh, supposed to be a pretty good day. Uh, looking at the river readings, um, Appalach last week at around Saturday crested at just under 20 feet. Uh, it has fallen a little bit, but it's it's right around 19 now, and it's not falling very hard. So uh, it's uh, there's a lot of water down there. Uh, a lot of the landings you can't use, like the lower landing uh, at Howard's Creek. So uh, it, difficult fishing conditions at best. Uh, Choctahatchee crested at around 16 feet over the weekend it's 13 and a half today so it is it's falling slowly uh you know it's not it's not rushing out right now and as always when it's that high it's going to float a lot of things and so if you are out there running around be very careful there's there are things floating that uh uh you could you can get up on in a heartbeat um, so anyway we're going to take this first break, come right back with a couple of special guests. Hey, and welcome back. There's a couple of familiar faces here. Uh, Mark Cowart. Good morning, Bill. Good friend. And Greg Brudnicki, old, old good friend. Hi. So uh, <clears throat> He's we want to right. spend this first few minutes just, uh, <clears throat> we will be talking about some fishing today, although we haven't been doing any of it. Uh, with the water as high as it is, you know, our winter trips to St. Mark's, uh, to Goat Island area are useless. You know, Goat Island's underwater right now, so so that's not happening. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of things are getting a break right now. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of fish. The squirrels down at the river are definitely catching a break because that's underwater. And, uh, but, but, you know, it... it <clears throat> There's so much to talk about, and there's some things that we were. Mark was telling us this morning, and, and Greg was telling me really that I didn't know about. It's like, for instance, uh, the St. Joe at the state park. Yeah, Cape Sandblast has been cut in half, and there's a big wide pass there now, um, right through the middle of the state park, and uh, water's about 20 feet deep, 25 feet deep, rushing through there in and out. And it's this size before you get to the land. No, I think right? the land is behind you. So okay. that's that right when you get to the landing, it's just past it. Yeah, so it just cut through right, yeah. literally right there in 20 feet deep. Yeah, 20 right, to 25. You know, you know about changing the landscape of things and uh, Shell Island. Shell Island was really interesting. Uh, you get down, the further east you go in Shell Island, you there's a couple places you can see it washed over. It didn't, wa it didn't wash through, but washed over. And um, there are a bunch of boats on the east half of uh, Shell Island where they're piled up dead high and dry in the very middle of the island. Some of them all bunched together, some spread apart, probably about a half mile path uh, of, of, of boats right there. But they're all right dead in the middle, almost at the same float area. You can see like they got there and they just did and then the water went down and they're stuck. It's crazy. 
crazy. Man. It's amazing. And I, I'll also tell you, you know, I, it, when uh, Melinda and I went out one day and we rode all through, uh, kind of over toward um, uh, the, the, the plant there, the paper mill, and came back along the bank, I, it, I will say uh, there are a lot of beautiful houses along that water that you never knew were really there. You see you them. You can see them now. Uh, well, well <clears throat> what really gets me is, you know, Greg and I grew up here, or still growing up here, but everything looks, everything's different now. You know, it, it doesn't look like the place that, you know, that we oh, grew right. up in. That's right. And you kind of take for granted some of these majestic, for lack of a better word, trees that we had, you yeah. know. Two, three hundred, four hundred year old oak trees and big pine trees mm -hmm. that, you know, our kids, our grandkids won't see this place <clears throat> as it was before because, you know, I'll be. Well, they were riding, there when your great grandparents were here. Yeah, you, know, uh, you know, I'll be riding around and have to have to look twice occasionally to make sure of where I'm That's at. That's right. Your you landmarks know, have on, changed. On roads that, uh, that I thought That's I true. knew pretty well. Yep. And so, uh, but it was really. Uh, it was really heartwarming because we stayed and we're in Lynn Haven and, and uh, we couldn't leave the neighborhood for a day and a half. But, you know, the, to see all the neighbors coming out, checking on each other and starting we came to get and the found chainsaws you. out and, and uh, Mark came to the house, brought gas and, and we, had a, we had a small generator there. but. Uh, uh, and other people like Thad Stokes from Centennial Bank, a good friend of mine, and my oldest sons, and he made his way out there, brought ice, and I mean, it was just, uh, it was unbelievable at the outpouring of people on their own who, who came out to help. Now, we're going to talk about the coordinated effort that, uh, that, that Greg and others put together and, and kind of give you some really solid information uh, about what's going on now and, and what kind of what's happened. But, uh, uh, but you know, I, I was just really at the way people came together, you know, individually That's to right. help each other really, to <clears throat> me, was really just heartwarming. I mean, it, it was just an affirmation about the place where we live and, and what people, you know, will will do and sacrifice to to try to help other people. So, we're going to go ahead and take this quick break, and then we're going to come right back and talk about what's going on in the city and the county right now. All right, welcome back. Um, before I turn this over to Greg, uh, I really I have to say that that. I was extraordinarily impressed with the effort to get the power back on no doubt. And, and to establish services and in the time period in, in, in basically around two weeks, most of the people in the county had power back. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and that coordinated effort was just unbelievable. That's still unbelievable. I, and I probably a record. Was because the power lines weren't down, the poles were down. Everything, Everything was down. down. It was crazy. So as most of you know, Greg's a great fisherman and he's also the mayor here and has worked, I know personally, about 24 hours a day for the last two months on uh, on trying to bring us back to normal. Greg, tell us what's happened, where are we at, what's going on? Well, you know, the first night of the storm we went out um, and started surveying what was going on and my first impression was going to be it's going to be months of before you know we'd be able to restore services simply because uh, we had a vehicle going or a big front end loader going down 23rd street and just chopping lines so that poles would go ahead and fall down all the way because mm -hmm. they were They'll be you know, hanging yeah. <clears throat> just so that uh, you know people would so we'd be able to, to traverse from one place to another and uh, Gulf Power had as many as 18,000 people here, or not Gulf Power, but the power system for uh, the whole United States. 18,000 people here, about 7,500 trucks, and men and women working. Uh, unbelievable coordinated effort. Day and night. And, and got it. Uh, the houses that could take power by the 25th of October had power, if you could take power, mm -hmm. you know. And so uh, we had uh, 127 lift stations in the city, 124 were damaged. 
Yeah. So, so uh, and the 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 uh, sewer plant at Millville was totally uh, uh, devoured. And so, one of the things that we had to do was get those lift stations back up, and then uh, defer or 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 make the sewage that was uh, we had to transfer it from the plant that was broken, uh, busted. And, and, and not operable in Millville to the new plant that was not quite operable on 23rd yeah. Street. So uh, we got that done. Uh, Matt Marshall, uh, Marshall Brothers, put together a team of people. They had 100 people out there working and, uh, and got the water and sewer going uh, within just a, you know, within a little over a week after that. So uh, that way, because we had to get potable water to the mm -hmm. hospital. Right. And a lot of people don't realize that all of the nursing homes were damaged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both hospitals, they had to take all of the patients within the hospitals, both hospitals, as well as all the nursing home patients, and take them somewhere else. And so uh, right now, Gulf Coast is probably about half their beds available. Bay Medical's got about 75. Uh, and, and so it's probably going to be the rest of the year before Bay Medical, uh, till the end of the year before they will get back up and running. But in the meantime, you know, the nursing homes, we still have most of our nursing patients out of the out of the town, out of the out of the county. My mom's in and, Crestview. Yeah, <clears throat> and it's and it's amazing. The, I am so impressed with the resiliency of our people. Yes. Okay, it, it, from the kindergartners that got displaced from their schools to the elderly and the infirm that got displaced from their nursing home or from the hospital, how people have just been so resilient and 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 you know FEMA has said the same thing. I've been in dozens and dozens of meetings all hours of the day and night for the last two months. I haven't even thought about going fishing. And and to hear them talk about, boy, I can't believe your people here. And I said, well, let me tell you something about our people here. Our people here have been the people that have gone west to help people in Katrina, mm -hmm. that have gone west to help people in Pensacola, mm -hmm. that have gone all over to, so they're seasoned. They know about storms, yeah. even though we never got carpet bombed like we did this time. And so that resiliency has really helped us to, because it was neighbors helping neighbors. I know FEMA is not working, going as fast as we go. Nobody goes as fast as I go. You know, so, we, so we are, and, and our city manager, Mark McQueen, has been a phenomenal find what a for choice. us. To, to be able good to have, time. yeah, yeah good I mean, time. the guy's been involved in rebuilding, you know, uh, Baghdad. He was he was just been, you know, in the, in the service uh, and only retired. He only been at work for two weeks, <laughs> and all of a sudden, this this is what he gets. So, um, it's been a tireless effort. We have a lot of things that we're working on now to help in the future, uh, and we're going to make Panama City a better and Bay County a better place. Right. That's right. And we just have to go through all the steps of doing that. I mean, our plan is to plant 100,000 trees by 2025, okay? We know, we just planted a cathedral oak behind the Cove sign on Friday that uh, Joe Littleton donated this tree. It's a thousands, and I don't know how many he paid for that tree, but it's a very expensive tree. But it's just an example of some of the things that we are going to do to try to make up for uh, the storm. So uh, uh, from a money standpoint, uh, there's, we have to, we have a bill that we're going to have to pay, um, and will we have time to go into this now, or we need to? You're still good. Okay, man. I'm sorry. fascinated. I'll let you know. Okay. Um, I'll slap you when you okay. get So anyway, right now it's considered a 75-25 storm. 12.5% would be paid by the state, 12.5% by the city for the, for the expenses within the city itself, and 75% from FEMA. We're hoping it ends up being a 90-10 situation, so that's five for the state, five for the city, and 90 for FEMA. That would be even better if it would be 100% by FEMA. And, and so there's, uh, as far as what we've got right now, uh, debris-wise, we pick up about 100,000 square yards of debris a year in the city. Okay, mm -hmm. we have picked up 20 years worth so far wow. in about seven and a half weeks. <laughs> I believe it. And we yeah, still have, everywhere. and we still have, probably another over 50 percent of it to get. That's right. Now we will be, if you know, and people are saying, when are they going to come on my street? You know, we want to have at least make a first pass by Christmas. We will make three passes. Okay, and so we will also have part of this plan 
uh, I know for the city will be white goods, whereas if you have a refrigerator or a freezer, you can put it out there, they will pick it up, okay? Mm -hmm. Eventually, you know, we'll get to that point. And we will have three passes, and um, there's been other uh, thoughts as to what, we've had, some, we've had some scoundrels here, you know, uh, some of these contractors, we've put many of them in jail that are unlicensed people. And so uh, the other day we got the emergency time extended for an, another 60 days. That's good. Because it's a third degree felony during emergency time mm -hmm. to be doing unlicensed activity, but during uh, after that or during regular time, it's only a misdemeanor. Right. So you could have somebody that comes in, pays their thousand dollar fine, and goes back and goes starts right being a scoundrel. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. so we got it extended another 60 days. And uh, uh, I'll talk about debris uh, after we have the yeah. We take a break. All right, yeah, let's let's go ahead and take this break real quick. We'll uh, we'll learn some more about what's going on uh, currently and uh, actually talk about a little bit of fishing. Okay, Greg, what do we need to know right now? Well, in the future, what we're what we are working on is, of course. If anyone, one of the things that, that I need to let everybody know is if, if there was, if you were affiliated with anyone that was doing some volunteerism during the time of the storm, or doing it right now, any amount of hours, any amount of food, any amount of money that you donated to help someone, any church organization, any volunteer organization, we need to have those recorded hours because believe it or not, that that money that was spent, that time that was given, that work that was done, if it's recorded on a piece of paper, it will help to pay our 5%. I got you. Because that you is money we get credit people. for. That there is you go. So the thing is, what we do not want to happen is, I do not want this bill to be on the backs of the taxpayers. Right. Yeah. Okay? We are going to have um, some value drops. Right now, according to Dan Sal's office, there's about a 15% drop, okay? That means that your millage rate would have to go up, okay, to be able to offset the storm. We do not, the people have suffered enough. Our citizens have suffered enough. That's right. I do not expect them to have to have a storm and pay for this bill. So we will do everything in our power to make sure that we capture all of those uh, hours that we're doing the credits, the credits, so that we can use that with FEMA. That's right. That's great. Man. That's great to know. Very important. Man. Good job. It's man. a lot more than getting power back on and getting the place cleaned That's up. That's right. It gets wow. really deep, and having yeah. somebody looking out for us is amazing. All right, we are going to talk about fishing, and Mark, you're the only one that's done it, but you had the the championship was not yeah. long ago. Yeah. We got pictures, and you got about five minutes. I All know right. that's so, difficult. Well, you know, the storm really played into what Michael and I chose to do. The, the folks that follow us on social media, they saw we were really torn there for several days leading up when it was time to leave our home here and our and our and, and the folks in the community that we were doing everything we could to help. Um, Michael and I had to go. We went to Louisiana. The uh, IFA Redfish Tour had their championship there. We were torn on whether to go or not. Uh, we were in seventh place for team of the year leading up to that championship. And while it was virtually no way we were going to end up with team of the year, we said, well, why don't we just go? We worked as hard all year long. You know, we had, we had a good year up to that point. Um, so we go. And, uh, you know, Michael and I, uh, is a very difficult fishing situations, went from ultra high water to ultra low water during the tournament. So every moment pre-fishing changed. We did figure out that we had to plan ahead knowing the water was going to drop out based on weather. Mm. So we went and found places that were three to four feet deep to fish versus two feet deep because the two because it was going to be over two foot water drop. So we everything we did was based on if it happens this way, we'll be good. The first day, uh, Michael and I come in with a little over 16 pounds, which that's kind of the, the benchmark in these tournaments. If you got 16, you're in pretty good mm -hmm. shape. 13th place. Two fish. Two fish. Um, so um, we go, the next day we go right back, there's even less water, but we're still able to get into the spot once we're in there, we're floating. Water wasn't real clean, you know, you do a lot of sight fishing, there's one of the pictures that you can see Mike and I standing up on a tower, sight fishing. It's, it's awesome, but when it's cloudy, 
you can't see as well, or when the water's dirty, you don't see as well. So one of us is blind casting, one of us is sight fishing. We come back in the second day a little better, had a little more weight the second day. So we come in, we're thinking, okay, you know what, we might, we might get close to cracking the top 10. And um, sure enough, we come in and we're sitting there watching all the guys come and go and, you know, and, uh, you know, we're watching the TV crews do their deal and we're trying to figure out exactly where we are. Well, we got near the end. Um, we end up eighth, we eighth place for the championship. Um, very proud of that. Um, I mean, you're talking about the elite anglers there. And uh, to finish in that top 10 was a big deal for us. But then we found out we finished runner-up for team of the year. We yeah. passed six other teams. Wow. We couldn't catch the guys. Uh, we, we beat everybody we were ahead of us enough to catch up their points and beat them. But we couldn't catch the leaders. And But, you know, uh, you know, one of the pictures that we've got, uh, you, you know, you can see Mike Lyon on stage with all of the, the top 10 and the team of the year guys. And, um, you know, it was just a great year for us. We had two seconds this year. One of the seconds was we were two one hundredths of a pound out of first place. I mean, that's crazy to think that you fish all day and you end up with three or four drops of water out of first place. Uh -huh. And uh, but you know we had is I'm you know the storm really changed a lot of things in the bay. If you're running out there, be very very careful. Just talk about fishing here. I've been out twice. Once was just to kind of mess around, but more to look around. Uh, and then we did go out, Trevor Taylor and I went out Saturday morning and fished for just a little while. Uh, trout bites on fire, by the way. Um, good trout. Can't uh, prove it by <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, but, uh, but the red fishing, you know, the red fish are here. Um, if you look at some of the social media posts, they're catching a lot of really good fish. Uh, uh, you know, Taylor Wheeler that works for me, she went out with her and her, her boyfriend and over the weekend and they caught fish all day. And, uh, and I think it's wonderful, you know. Um, but well, it's 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 time to start trying to do some normal, normal whatever stuff. That's normal right. is. That's it's right. Time to do that. Well, right? there's a new normal. Oh, time to fish. We are yeah. going to have to go. Listen, I hope you've enjoyed the show. We could do this probably for two hours, <laughs> but uh, Greg, I appreciate your efforts and this entire you, team Greg. combined. They just continue to work. Thank this you. is going to go along for a long no, time. No doubt. So uh, God bless, we hope you're well, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching America's only daily outdoor TV show, Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester, featuring hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.